Welcome, friend. Follow me. We're going somewhere dark, somewhere dangerous. Most people would never dare enter the place we are going. There's no telling what horrors we'll find, what terrors we'll uncover. Don't say I didn't warn you. We might discover terrible monsters lurking there. Be careful, they could follow you out. Or maybe they're already inside you. Are you afraid? Good. Now you are ready to enter the Warning Woods. Christmas Eve brought the Massey family together for the first time since February. Or at least, what was left of the Massey family. Leo Massey, the patriarch, died suddenly at the age of 78 after suffering an aneurysm on an escalator at the mall. His wife, Genevieve, had not been with him at the time, and no one else could catch him before he toppled over the side. He fell 15 feet, head first, into the children's play area. Fortunately, he did not crush any children, but a few of them were definitely scarred. Leo's funeral was the last time his wife had seen her two sons, Seth and Eric, or their families. Even Seth's recently estranged wife had been there to say farewell to jovial old Leo. She and Seth had only separated a few days after New Year's, so the tension between them had still felt deadly. But tension did not kill Seth's ex. A semi-truck did. A truck with a cab a little too high to see her motorcycle in front of it at a red light. Due to ill feelings over the divorce, the Masseys were asked not to attend her funeral. The losses didn't stop there. Eric's wife Marilyn had been pregnant at Leo's funeral for the first time since their miracle child Jonah had been born. By Christmas, she was no longer pregnant, but Jonah didn't have a little sibling either. Despite a year of tragedy, the remaining Masseys roused cheerful spirits as they sipped wine, or grape juice in Jonah's case, ate cookies, and watched old Christmas classics on mute so they could converse with one another. Now that's a shame, Seth said as he tipped the empty wine bottle over what would have been his third glass. He disappeared into the kitchen for a moment. Everyone else listened to the fire crackle while they waited for him to return. When he reappeared, he raised a fist triumphantly wrapped around a bottle of Jameson. Good thing I came prepared, he beamed. Seth first offered the whiskey to his mother, who shook her head and put a hand over her glass. He then offered it to Eric. Oh, I'm not sure about... Give it here, Eric's wife Marilyn broke in. She snatched the bottle out of Seth's hand and poured herself a double. Genevieve laughed heartily as Eric gaped. Seth joined the laughter. Little Jonah only six years old and too young to understand, stared vacantly at Ralphie silently beating the hell out of that red-headed bully on the TV. Seth poured his own drink and plopped down in the lazy boy that his father had occupied last Christmas Eve. Is it time? he asked. Marilyn gave him a sour look. I really don't think we need to do it this year, she said. Aw, oh, honey, it's tradition, Eric whined. Now, Eric, if Marilyn can't handle it, let's not make her... Genevieve said slyly. Can't handle it, Marilyn replied, pretending to throw some invisible object at her mother-in-law. I was just trying to protect your delicate sensitivities, old lady. Everyone laughed so heartily Jonah broke his trance to look at them. What? What's so funny? He asked. Ignoring him, or maybe not hearing him, Seth announced, It's decided then. Let the haunting of Christmas Eve 22 begin. Who wants to go first? Marilyn raised an eyebrow at the rest of the hesitant family before saying, I'll go if no one else has the balls. I didn't think we'd do this, but I came prepared anyway. Seth snorted and drunkenly punched the air between himself and Marilyn. She began her story. It was 1944. All of the men in the small town of Jameson, Hey, Seth cheered, holding up the whiskey bottle. Don't interrupt her, you'll ruin the flow, Eric scolded. All of the men in Jameson were off fighting the war, Marilyn continued, smirking at Seth and his bottle. Wendy and her children had to tend to their small farm all on their own. They had an old barn. Oh, honey, you told a haunted barn story last year, Eric murmured as if he were heroically saving her from some great embarrassment. Excuse me, I thought we weren't supposed to interrupt, Genevieve chided. Eric blushed. Thank you, Jenny, Marilyn said. Anyway... They had a drafty old barn on their farm where the cows and horses slept at night. One night, during a full moon, 
Wendy woke up to the sound of every cow and every horse whinnying and whimpering. The animals sounded terrified. A year ago, she would have woken up her husband to send him out with his shotgun, but this was a different world. The farm was her responsibility now, and so was the well-being of the animals. Besides, she thought, a shotgun does just as much good in the arms of a woman as it does held by a man. Hear, hear, Genevieve cheered. The animal's cries only got louder as time passed. Armed with her husband's 12-gauge, Wendy hurried across the yard to the barn. The doors were still closed when she reached the barn. A good sign. Unless... Unless it was a person who had snuck in. Someone smart enough to close the door behind them. Marilyn paused to sip her whiskey. She noticed Jonah was listening now and she hesitated. Hey, Jonah, just remember these stories are all made up, okay? They're not real. Okay, he replied dully. Where was I? Oh yes, she's at the barn door. Well, even over the animal's cries, Wendy could hear another sound clear as day. Chop. 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 She recognized the sound of an axe blade getting buried in wood. She cocked the shotgun and slowly slid the doors apart to peer in. Moonlight shone in through the rafters, illuminating the barn's interior, but only enough to outline shadowy silhouettes. All of the animals were on their feet, pacing and jumping in their stalls. One corner remained entirely shrouded in shadow but every few seconds the axe would appear out of that corner, swinging through the air and disappearing into the darkness before each chop. Wendy's hands trembled as she raised the shotgun. She yelled, drop the axe and step into the light. But the hidden man chopped once more. Then he went quiet. Wendy kept the shotgun aimed at where he stood, disguised by darkness. Suddenly something flew out of the shadows directly at her head. She leapt back as the thing landed on the ground with a wet splatter. Wendy looked down and saw a bloody arm severed at the elbow. Without thinking, she fired into the darkness. There was a flash of light from the gun's muzzle. Buckshot flew through the air, getting buried in the wood throughout the barn, but fortunately not hitting any animals. That dark corner remained still and quiet. Had she killed him? Wendy wondered. She didn't notice the arm that had landed at her feet had now vanished. She crept forward into the barn. The animals, first alarmed by the shotgun blast, now began to calm down. She approached the dark corner, wondering what she would find there. But all she found once she got close enough to see through the darkness was the axe they used to split wood, leaning against the wall. Marilyn sat back on the couch and took another drink. There you go, she said. Who's next? Wait, that's it? Seth asked. Marilyn rolled her eyes. Okay, okay. Um, during every full moon from then on, Wendy heard the animals crying out, but she never went back to the barn. Some nights when the air was still and quiet, she could hear that sound from her bedroom. Chop, chop, chop. Still not satisfied, Seth slurred. I thought it was perfect, Eric said. Should I go next? His mother gestured for him to take over. All right then, here we go. A club comic booked a gig way out at some little dive in rural Ohio. He didn't think it would get him much exposure, but the owner had promised to pay him 200 bucks without any holds on turnout. A guaranteed 200 bucks made the drive worth every minute to the struggling comic. The only problem was he was supposed to be his cousin's best man at his wedding in Cedar Rapids, Iowa the next day. That meant he would have to wrap up the Ohio gig, get right in his car, and drive through the night to get to Iowa. If he was lucky, he could sneak in a couple of hours of sleep before his wedding duties began. Is this supposed to be scary? Seth sneered. I'm getting to it, you jerk, Eric shot back. Okay, so the Ohio gig went even better than the comic expected. He even got some A-grade crowd work in. His only regret was not filming any of it for his Instagram. But then came time to get back behind the wheel and drive the long, empty roads to Iowa. The comic was already tired before he left the parking lot. He stopped to fill his tank and grab the largest black coffee he could get at the gas station. It did little to help. Somewhere in Indiana, he drifted off for the first time. His tires hit the rumble strip and jolted him back awake. He was grateful to be the only car on the road. 
Heaven forbid he could have drifted into the oncoming lane and gotten hit by a... Eric paused abruptly. He had been about to say, hit by a semi, when the memory of what had happened to his ex-sister-in-law rendered him mute. If he had caught himself a moment sooner, he might have been able to smooth over the faux pas, but now everyone could easily guess what he had almost said. The words, though unspoken, rang through their heads. The general mood in the room soured dramatically just in that brief moment. Hit by another car, Eric said, looking down and away from the rest of the family. He cleared his throat, and even though Seth and Genevieve were staring sadly at the carpet, his wife was glaring at him. He continued the story. In the middle of nowhere, Illinois, the comic drifted off again. This time, he veered off so sharply that the rumble strips didn't wake him up in time. When he opened his eyes, he saw giant corn stalks rushing toward him. Acting on impulse, he jerked the wheel and slammed the gas pedal, hoping he could drive fast enough to get himself out of the ditch. The last thing he needed was to get stranded in the night. His car lurched and protested, but he managed to muscle it back onto the road, where he started to breathe easy. The adrenaline and excitement might just have been enough to get him to Iowa. But less than a mile later, he came to the end of the road. Literally. He saw it up ahead in the headlights. He didn't believe his eyes at first, but after shaking his head, he had to accept it. The highway came to an abrupt stop just a few yards ahead. He barely stopped his car before the road became nothing but prairie grass swaying in the gentle breeze. He stepped out of the car, nervous the road might vanish under his feet. The GPS had shown this highway going almost all the way to Cedar Rapids. There was no construction signs or detour warnings, and the height of the grass indicated there hadn't been pavement there for weeks at least. Probably closer to months. The comic looked out into the darkness and saw something green reflecting back at him. A mile marker. It looked eerie out there in the edge of the headlights with nothing else around. As the comic stared at the lone mile marker, he didn't notice the dense fog settling in. He ventured out beyond the end of the road, wondering if this was just some sort of prank. He wondered if he could find where the highway continued and maybe figure out how to keep driving. The fog grew thicker around him, making it nearly impossible to see even while he was still in range of the headlights. To try to comfort himself, he started whistling. He didn't whistle any particular tune, just some happy-sounding melodies to ignore the strange situation he had found himself in. At the edge of the headlights, the comic still only found grass under his feet. The world beyond that point was so dark, but he had to keep searching. He had to find the road. He couldn't turn back, not now. There was nothing for him back the way he had come. So into the dark fog, the whistling comic disappeared. In the morning, a farmer driving between two of his fields came across a car that had run off the road and flipped over in the ditch. It had landed upside down on top of the cornfield. Thick, live stalks of corn had shattered most of the windows, and two of them had pierced the torso of the car's driver. One appeared to have impaled his heart. Resting on the roof of the car, a farmer noticed a card. It was an invitation to a wedding in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, that very day. Eric sat back, satisfied. Seth and his mother seemed to have recovered and were now staring at him with expectant gazes. Wait, that's it? Marilyn asked, sounding just like Seth reacting to her own story. That's it, Eric replied. But I thought he drove out of the ditch, Genevieve said, now looking into the fire like it had said something rude to her. Oh man, it doesn't sound as good if I have to explain it, Eric complained. The end of the road is an expression we use when someone dies, right? They've reached the end of the road. Or when somebody gets caught in a crime, Seth added. Like, it's the end of the road for you, buster. Sure, Eric conceded. So, in my story, I used a literal end of the road to portray the comic's transition into death. He gets to the end of the road and walks off into the abyss. A collective, ah, resonated from everyone but Jonah, who had been distracted by the TV again. His dad's story hadn't captured him like his mom's had. Well, my story doesn't have any hidden messages or meanings, Seth said. But who's ready to hear it anyway? Go on, Seth. Genevieve prompted. Seth cleared his throat. 
I was working on my computer. First person, huh? Eric interrupted. Seth raised an eyebrow at him, and Eric raised his hands in surrender. I was paying some bills and such on my computer, Seth restarted, when I heard something that sounded like a door opening somewhere in my house. I was alone, so naturally I got a little spooked. I got my gun out of the desk drawer and started clearing the house like we did in Iraq, only I never had to do that alone over there. I was so on edge I decided to put the safety back on in case someone who had a reason to be there had come in. I didn't know what that reason could be, but I wondered if maybe I had forgotten something. That started happening to me after the divorce. Oh, and this happened in broad daylight. It seemed like a strange time for a burglary. But in the end, I didn't find anyone in the house after all. It was just me. So that night, I got to relaxing in front of the TV, and wouldn't you know it, I heard the same sound again. This time, I heard it a little differently, though. It sounded less like a door and more like, well, sort of like a loud tearing sound, but with a real heavy gut to it. It sounded like a sonic boom from a jet, only much, much smaller. And it sounded like it came from the kitchen. I got up slowly so the couch wouldn't squeak and give me away. Seth's audience sat captivated as he told his story. Even Jonah appeared to be on the edge of his seat again, even though he was sitting on the floor. He had become so entranced he had invented an invisible edge on which to perch. Eric couldn't help but wonder why his brother had chosen to tell his story in the first person, and why he had used his real house for the setting. He had to admit it was a brilliant tactic to make the story more intense, but it took some of the fun out of the Christmas haunting. Traditionally, the annual haunting had been a time when the Masseys brought out their most creative, wild, and usually unbelievable scary stories to share with each other. The tradition had started innocently, with Leo Massey telling Eric and Seth a truncated version of A Christmas Carol. He had noted how much they responded to the Christmas ghosts, particularly the spirit of Christmas is yet to come, and began creating his own Christmas ghost stories. One year, Eric invented a story too, which made Seth want to do the same. Even Genevieve occasionally spun a tale at the fireside on a few Christmas Eves. But this story, this account tailored to mimic reality, didn't give Eric the same warm buzz his family's ghost tales normally did. When I got to the kitchen, I found nothing. Nobody was in there waiting for me. It had gotten dark, so I flipped on the light, and in the corner of my eye, I caught something leaving the room. Jonah wove his fingers deep into the carpet. It was low to the ground and just sort of slid out of the kitchen. In the short second that I saw it, it sort of looked like the end of a train on a wedding dress, only it had a dark, dingy color to it, far from the innocent white a bride would wear. This dress, if it really was a dress, belonged at a funeral. I followed the thing out of the kitchen, turning on the lights every step of the way, but I couldn't find it. I might have thought I had only imagined it if I didn't feel like I was being watched the whole time. Eric noticed a greenish hue creeping over Jonah's face as Seth narrated. He considered interrupting his brother and asking Jonah to leave, but decided the damage had already been done. Sparing Jonah from the end would only cause him to create his own conclusions, which, for all Eric knew, could be far more terrible than whatever closing Seth was taking them to. There is one room in the house that I left unopened during my search. I had two reasons for this. One, it was Tara's office before she moved out. The door had stayed shut ever since she dropped the bomb. That's the second reason. The door was still shut. I hadn't heard it open, so I figured whoever I heard and saw in the kitchen couldn't have been in there. But once I had cleared the rest of the house and retrieved my handgun, I knew I had to check that office just to be sure. I opened that door for the first time in weeks, very, very slowly. The hinges popped and squealed loudly. Seeing Tara's things gone made my heart feel like an iron weight. First I saw her bookshelves. She had left them behind but had taken all of her books and knickknacks, and the walls were bare where she used to have some artwork hanging. Once I pushed the door open a little further, I could see she had also left her desk. Like the bookshelves, it appeared to be empty. She had only left one item on that desk. A phone. It was connected to our... my... landline. I had been thinking about shutting it off, but hadn't pulled the trigger yet. It never rang anymore. 
I thought the one by my bed was the only one I still had, but apparently she had left hers connected when she split. Well, I got lost in the memories and emotions tied up in that room and forgot my purpose for a second. I pushed the door all the way open to step into the room and got an instant reminder. There was a woman in there, middle-aged, standing next to the desk. She was wearing the dark brown dress I had seen leave the kitchen. She also wore a veil over her face, but I could still see her green eyes shining at me. Her entire body was sort of shivering and shaking like it was taking an immense effort for her to stay in place. I was so trapped by her appearance and the steely look in her eyes that at first I didn't notice she was pointing at the phone on the desk. The longer we stared at each other, the more I became convinced that this thing in front of me wasn't a woman at all, but something, something else. Its eyes held so much malice, and it seemed to be directing it all at me. We held each other's gazes, just staring and staring and staring. Then the phone rang. It sounded impossibly loud in the stillness of the room and made me jump back so fast I hit my wrist on the open door beside me. The woman thing didn't look surprised in the slightest. She just kept pointing at the phone. If anything, the malice in her eyes increased. I couldn't see her face behind the veil, but her eyes indicated a sinister grin. I couldn't bring myself to get any closer to her. The phone rang once, twice, three times. After five rings, it would go to voicemail. Four rings passed. Last chance. Five. I heard Tara's recorded voice instructing the caller to leave a message. I hadn't changed the landline's outgoing message since she left. It's amazing how many little things like that slip your mind when your whole life's turned upside down. The woman thing stopped pointing at the phone as a serious voice I didn't recognize began to speak. Here, Seth paused to look at each member of his audience. He paid special attention to Jonah, who looked physically ill. He felt a ping of regret for not offering a warning before launching into his tail, but it was too late to go back now. He rolled two potential endings around in his head. One, the one he had planned on telling, suddenly seemed too disturbing when Seth looked into Jonah's big, wet eyes, but the alternative ending was flat and uninteresting. He worried he would be forced to continue the story, further tormenting the child, if he went that route. He opted for the original ending. It was simple. Just one sentence. That phone call was my official notification of Tara's death. Everyone was quiet until Eric shook his head and said, Way to bring down the mood, man. These stories are supposed to be fun. You can't bring a story about something so serious and real to Christmas Eve. Don't you think this family has dealt with death enough already? He's not making it up, Jonah said softly. All eyes went to the boy with his fingers wrapped around bushy carpet fibers. The nightmare lady followed you home from Grandpa Leo's funeral, he told Seth. Jonah, what are you talking about? Who's the nightmare lady? Marilyn asked gently. That scary lady was at Grandpa Leo's funeral. She sat in the back the whole time except for... Jonah trailed off, seeming to decide against verbalizing the memory that had surfaced in his mind. Go ahead, kiddo, Eric encouraged him. Tell us. Please, Seth added. His voice sounded heavy and serious, almost like he had expected this sort of revelation. Remember when you and Mom went up to see Grandpa? Jonah asked Eric. Yeah, I do. Remember I didn't want to? We remember, Marilyn said. That's when she walked over to me, Jonah said. She came up behind me when all the grown-ups were away and whispered in my ear. She told me to be a good boy or that my sister would die. I told her I don't have a sister. I think she thought I was somebody else. Eric and Marilyn gave each other uncomfortable, sad looks. They hadn't told Jonah that Marilyn had gotten pregnant or about the miscarriage. It had occurred shortly after they had learned their baby would be a girl. When the funeral was over, I saw her follow Uncle Seth out, only she was standing on top of Aunt Tara. On top of her? Seth asked. Yeah, kind of. Aunt Tara was sort of inside her. Is that the end of your story? Eric asked Seth. Yeah, that's it, Seth confirmed. I haven't seen the woman since. Eric nodded. He looked to Marilyn, but she had her head turned away from him. 
From his position, she appeared to be watching the fire. Genevieve was the only one who could see Marilyn's tears. I had a story, Genevieve said, watching her daughter-in-law release her emotions. But I'm afraid it was a little too similar to Seth's, and I don't think anyone wants to hear it right now. I don't even think I want to tell it. Maybe it's time to turn in. Everyone nodded. Their drinks had stopped lightening their moods and started weighing down their heads. Genevieve stood slowly and grabbed her cane off the arm of her chair. She hobbled across the room. Before she left, she turned back slightly and said, Merry Christmas, everyone. I love you all. You made it out. Congratulations. If you enjoyed the story, please rate and review this podcast wherever you like to listen. Reviews are the best way to support the podcast and help it grow. You can also become a patron at patreon.com slash the warning woods. If you want more creepy content, including the images that accompany each story, follow me on Instagram at the warning woods. If you feel ready, meet me here next week for another journey into the warning woods. Thank you for listening.